Hey everybody, this is Mr. Moppin coming at you with another a, a, uh, AP Go uh, video. Uh, this is our sixth video in the uh, series focusing in on topic 2.2, structures, powers, and functions of Congress. Now last time we were here, we were going through the process of how a bill becomes a law. And if you remember from last time, we were talking about how a bill would go from being introduced to a subcommittee, as you can see here. Uh, and then if it is... Um, approved and then goes to a full committee and then from the full committee if it's in the house it goes to the rules committee to set up rules for debate um, and after the rules committee it goes to the full house after the full committee uh, it will then go to the full senate so what we're looking at here where we're starting with is when both of these when when a bill has made it to the full chamber either the senate or the house and this is where things really do start to get pretty interesting and fun because you know if a bill has made it this far that means there is some very, very real possibility that that bill is going to get approved and could uh, very well become law. So this is where things really get things get really get critical. This is where lots of deals are made. Uh, so this is really, really, really uh, the most significant part of the legislative process right here. Now, if that bill is reported out favorably, it then go from the committee, full committee, that goes to what we call the floor or the full chamber. Now. You gotta understand that you know most people tend to think that the way that Congress works is in a very linear manner. You know they tend to think that okay, we introduce a bill, it, that bill then goes through the committee process, then it goes to the chamber, and then it's considered, and then it's voted on, and then we move on and start all over again with the next bill. That's not how it works. First off, the committees are uh, working on their own bills that are germane to their committees. You got tons and tons of bills are being considered simultaneously just at the committee level. And even those bills that come out of committee and then make it to the full chamber, even those bills are, are coming in at different times. And note, when you're looking at it from a chamber perspective, you could schedule debate on a certain day at a certain time, then pick it up again at a different day at a different time. So basically when these things are put on calendars, it's in a non-linear manner. Basically what you just need to understand is that you know, Congress is juggling a lot of bills simultaneously. Uh, some bills move at a faster pace than others, and so just be aware of that. Now, even though I've kind of said that we're starting off once we're in the full chamber, uh, there are some of the things that we tend to see in the House that uh, could happen that you, know, you might want to be aware of. For example, uh, the Rules Committee might stipulate that even before the full chamber actually considers the bill, they may ask for one more consideration by what's called the House Committee of the Whole, uh, which is kind of like a super committee, if you will, that has upwards of about 100 members in it. So that could happen. That's a possibility. Uh, something that is certainly the norm now in the House, and this started about 20 years ago with uh, former Speaker Dennis Hastert, is what's known as the majority of the majority rule. In other words... The way that uh, the majority party now operates is in a way to make sure they have total dominance over the legislative agenda in that chamber is that only bills that have a majority of the majority party support will be considered on the floor. So in other words, um, if it's a bill that has almost total support of the minority party and some support, though not most, of the majority party, that bill is not going to be considered because basically the majority party wants only wants bills to get through that the majority party wants. That's it. They don't want to run the risk of the minority party getting something done that they want simply by kind of peeling off a few of the majority party's members. So that so this recent rule in the last 20 years or so has only strengthened majority party domination in the House. Now, notes, uh, when we do get to this point right here, uh, depending on the rules in the House and, of course, in the Senate, this could always happen, uh, you can still have uh, proposed amendments, uh, you know, marking up of the bill more, uh, you know, depending on, you know, what, what the rules are in terms of, you know, how much time you've got for it. As we said before, sometimes, you know, in the Senate, you get these, uh, these amendments that are called riders that are added to a bill that may have zero in terms of germaneness to what the bill is about. Uh, you know, this is kind of the point where, you know, when a bill gets this far, there's a real sense, as I said a moment ago, that that bill really 
has a good chance of passing at this point. And if that bill looks like it has a good chance of passing, it's kind of like, hey, we want to catch this train that's pulling out of the station. So in other words, you know, if this thing looks like it's going to make it make its way, you know, you want to kind of tie on as much as you can that you want on there because it looks like this thing is going to be going through. So that's where you tend to see, you know, a lot of things getting added to bills that may not seem very germane to it. Uh, we also will see potentially the creation of what we call omnibus bills. And basically what an omnibus, omnibus, omnibus bill is, is when you've got multiple bills that then can be merged together as like a mega bill. And once again, what that does is kind of raise the stakes a little bit in terms of pressure to get something passed. So in other words, you know, if you like one bill and don't, you're not too jazzed on a second bill, if those bills are merged, now you got added pressure because when they were individual, you could kind of support one and reject the other. But now that they're merged, now you've got more pressure to kind of think about, all right, you know, how much do I really like the one bill and how much do I dislike the other bill? You know, can you, can you tolerate the bill you don't like because it is now tied to the bill that you do like? So that's what can kind of happen if you have an omnibus bill, you know, basically a mega bill, if you will. Um, now, when we get into the Senate, this is where things can get really interesting. Uh, we've said before that the Senate, as a rule, as a tradition, uh, does not have any limitations on uh, debate time. And this was done, you know, pretty much as, as a part of the design of the founders. The founders don't put in the Constitution, but it's, you know, with the blessings of what the founders intended. Remember, the Senate was designed to be kind of the cooling agent to what might be the, the hot, you know, the hot, passionate fervor of the House. Uh, and so the idea being is that, you know, the House moves quickly, it moves efficiently, relatively speaking, uh, and the Senate is a more, is a slower, more deliberative body by definition, by design. And, and part of that is allowing members individually to have as much time as they want to talk about it. There's no clock, there's no time limit. They can talk as long as they want. Uh, they can even uh, issue what are called holds, where an individual member could say, hey, you know, I still want to have more time to kind of learn what this bill is. Uh, so I want to kind of delay voting on this just to kind of get a sense of, you know, really what's in this bill. So, you know, in the Senate, there, there's, a, there's a real emphasis on taking your time, taking it slowly, being deliberative so that, you know, the Senate kind of feels like if, it, if it's moving too fast, it's not doing its job. And it has to kind of check what the House wants to do. So that's why that's there. Now, note, with this unlimited debate time, that then can be weaponized into what we call a filibuster. Uh, a filibuster is when somebody uses that unlimited debate time for the specific purpose of trying to prevent a bill from coming up for a vote. So the idea being is, you know, if you can speak, you know, for a limited amount of time, the bill can't be brought up for an actual vote until every senator has had an opportunity to say their piece on a bill. And if you just keep talking and talking and talking and continue to hold the floor, then that bill never comes up for a vote. So a filibuster is the intentional uh, refusal to give up, uh, you know, control of your speaking time, uh, still holding the floor uh, for the specific purpose of preventing that bill from coming up for a vote. Now, you know, who, where, you know, what kind of person would do this? Well, it would be a member of the minority party. Uh, if you're in the majority, uh, you know, you're you're not going to want to hold up a bill because you're on the side that's going to, you know, want the bill passed. But if you are on the minority side and you know that uh, when this bill comes up for a vote, you're going to lose, this could be used as a kind of a, a last ditch effort to, you know, try to prevent that bill from getting passed. Now, uh, understand that, you know, when we talk about this, you know, the way the filibuster works is that, you know, as long as you are speaking, here's, I mean, they actually do have rules for this. As long as you are standing, you are speaking, uh, you know, you can just keep holding it forever, uh, theoretically. Uh, the Senate does stipulate that you have to have the first hour be germane to what the bill is. But then after that, you could you could talk about anything. You could talk about, you know, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals. You could be talking about, 
uh, you know, uh, movies that are going to be coming out. You could read the Betty Crocker cookbook. Uh, you can read, you know, anything you want. And sometimes, you know, it does get a little goofy and weird. Uh, a few years ago, Senator Ted Cruz from Texas was trying to hold up uh, an expansion of funding for uh, for Obamacare. And in order to hold that up, uh, he started a filibuster. And after that first hour, he started reading all sorts of things, you know, things like, you know, parts of the Constitution and, and Declaration of Independence. And then he even started reading uh, Dr. Seuss books like Green Eggs and Ham. That's literally a copy of Green Eggs and Ham you can see there in the picture. You can read, you can say whatever you want to do as long as you keep talking you hold the floor, and as long as you hold the floor, you are delaying a bill from coming up for a vote. Uh, Senator Cruz's filibuster lasted upwards of 21 hours. If you're wondering how long the longest one was, the longest one was by Strom Thurmond in 1957 to uh, halt a civil rights bill. That lasted about 24 hours. Now, filibusters can be stopped. Uh, they can be stopped using what's called the cloture rule. The cloture rule stipulates that if you can get 60% of the Senate members uh, to approve, then cloture is, uh, you know, invoked, and then the floor is suspended by that by that by that person speaking. So, you can kill a filibuster if you can get 60% of the members to approve. Now, what that means in reality, generally speaking, is that you're going to require it's going to require some sort of bipartisan support to invoke that cloture. Uh, now. Keeping you know this in mind, you know, remember we are we've become more and more polarized as a country and more and more polarized in the Senate. So understand that the filibuster was something that was rarely, rarely ever used. I mean, rarely ever used. It was only used when a senator that was going to be on the losing side felt that that the passage of this bill would be so horrific, so apocalyptic that that they felt compelled to try to kill it even if they're the only one trying to kill the bill. Uh, what has happened from then is that since they have found that it's very hard to kill filibusters to get that 60%, uh, percent, uh, what minority parties start doing now is just uh, issuing filibusters just as part of the normal operating procedure, standard operating procedure. So what does that mean? That means now that any time a bill gets the chamber and the Senate, there is an automatic assumption that that bill will be filibustered. It's just automatically assumed because that's how common it is. In fact, part of why it's so common today is that they have actually uh, suspended the requirement that you keep talking to hold the floor to actually make the filibuster work. All you have to do is just in, it basically say, we're going to filibuster this, and then it's filibustered. That's it. And now you're saying now you have to have 60% approval to get this bill moving on. Now, if that's the case, you might be wondering, well, why did Ted Cruz, you know, do a 21-hour talkathon? Well, this was designed to bring attention to what was going on. This was a, a bit of a publicity stunt, if you will. But the idea is that, you know, if you do one of these old-timey filibusters, that will get media attention, which which it did. So it was done to to you know get publicity, get attention to what he was trying to accomplish. Uh, so understand, with this 60% being now the real majority needed to get anything done. And it, on paper, it's 51%, but in reality, it's 60%. Because of that, that has now slowed down the process dramatically. It slowed it down to an absolute crawl. Uh, Senate ability to get things done uh, has been, you know, very, 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 very handicapped over the last 20 years. So there's a, have been a very, very noticeable effect of that. So much so that, you know, Certain things that you really just can't, you know, you know, filibuster to death have now proven to become exceptions to a filibuster. For example, if you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, judicial vacancies on the court, you used to be able to filibuster those. Uh, but now, you know, there's a sense of we can't wait, we can't delay, we need these judges on the bench as soon as possible. And in the last few years, the Senate has changed the rules to basically say, no, you can't filibuster. A, a, a vote on a judicial appointment. Uh, you also cannot uh, filibuster something that is part of the budget, which we will get to next time. All right, we'll see you then. Bye for now.